Hey folks, this is the EDC lecture 5. So, in the past lecture, in the last lecture, uh, we discussed, we, we began with uh, the types of semiconductors. We discussed about the intrinsic semiconductor and the theory behind it. And then we uh, discussed about uh, the types of doping, which is uh, uniform doping and uh, non-uniform doping in a very, very, in a very explanatory manner. So, I believe that you must have gone through all the topics covered in the last couple of lectures. So, having said that, let's move on to the first topic of discussion in this uh, in this lecture. So, in this lecture, we will begin. We are going to start with the difference between the direct band gap semiconductors and indirect band gap semiconductors. The so direct band gap semiconductors and and indirect band gap semiconductors. So first topic of discussion is indirect indirect band gap semiconductors. Okay. So let me just change the color so that So let's begin with the the, uh, the energy band diagram of the indirect band gap semiconductors. So what do we mean by indirect band gap semiconductors? So let's see with the help of energy band diagrams. So this represents the conduction band and this is the valence band. By the way conduction band is also known as anti-bonding levels and valence band is also known as bonding level. So this is valence band and this is the conduction band. This is a trapping or the trapped region or the trapped uh, trapping levels. These are basically the trapping levels. So we basically represent the conduction band and the valence band like a parabolic structure like this. Okay. We represent it like this, the uh, parabolic structure. Okay. So this is basically a, trap, a trapping levels and we represent the conduction band and the valence bands as a parabolic, uh, uh, in a para so we consider the cylinder, uh, conduction band and valence band as parabolas. So like this, where these are the charge carriers present. For example, in the indirect band gate semiconductors, this represents the minima of the conduction band and this represents the maxima of the valence band. So this represents the minima of the conduction band and so this is basically the minima of conduction band this is maxima of valence band so what happens is that when the electrons make a transition from the conduction band that is basically from the minima of the conduction band they are first trapped they are first trapped in the trapping levels then they align themselves with the valence band or you can say they align themselves with the maximum of the conduction band and then again they make the transition to the valence band so there are two type of transition taking place of the electrons so first electrons make a transition from the minima of the conduction band to the trapping levels and then they make a transition from the trapping level to the maxima of the valence band so it is important to note down that the electrons transition the electron transition takes place from the central valley this is also known as the central valley this is also known as the central valley which is basically the conduction band minima to trapping levels then from trapping level to the valence band maxima of the banding levels so so like let's write that electrons make the transition transition from minima of conduction band to trapping levels and then to the maxima of valence band. So what happens during this transition? During these transitions electrons will make the collisions because of which the energy 
will be will be emitted in the form of heat radiation so let's write that point during during transition electrons collide resulting into the release of heat radiation okay so when the electrons make a transition from the conduction band to the valence band heat is dissipated so because of the uh, heat emission these devices these type of semiconductors are not suitable candidate for the fabrication of optoelectric devices like leds so cannot be be used in fabrication of fabrication of optoelectric devices like leds okay so if we consider the carrier lifetime of uh, the charge carriers carrier lifetime of charge carriers which is in this case is electrons is more than in indirect band gap semiconductor okay now you must be considering why is this so because electrons have to travel a longer distance as compared to that in the case of indirect band gap semiconductors that's why the carrier lifetime of the charge carriers that is which is which are electrons in this case is more than that in indirect band gap semiconductors here you can see that kinetic energy and potential energy change so in direct band gaps in direct band gap semiconductors so as the electrons are making transition from the conduction band to the valence band uh, the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the electrons change in the indirect band gap semiconductor okay momentum momentum of electrons also change because direction of the particle is same direction of particle is same okay so the examples for uh, indirect band gap semiconductor are silicon and germanium germanium and silicon are also known as element type semiconductors they are element type semiconductors so i think it is uh, much clear to clear to you now so we had also seen we also saw that uh, we also saw the plot we also saw the plot between the drift velocity and electric field intensity for the uh, indirect band gap semiconductors or, or for germanium and silicon as i already mentioned there is just like this okay so the variation of the drift velocity with electric field intensity is like this okay now we move on to the discussion of uh, direct band gap semiconductors direct band gap semiconductors dbgsc direct band gap semiconductors okay so let's begin our discussion again with the the energy band diagram of this type of semiconductors okay uh, let's begin with this so this is valence band this is conduction band by the way the examples for the direct band gap semiconductors are gallium arsenide or indium phosphide etc these are basically the compound type these are for compound type semiconductors they are basically the compound type semiconductors this is valence band and this is conduction band again conduction band is known as uh, anti bonding level valence band is bonding level what is the basic difference between the between uh, dbgsc and IDG, uh, idbgsc is that the central valley the central valley in the conduction band and the central valley in the valence band are aligned in the uh, are aligned on the same line they are aligned with each other the minima of the conduction band lies just above the maxima of the valence band okay 
what's also a, uh, it's also worth noting that in a indirect bend gas semiconductor we we only have the central valley we do not have the satellite valleys but in dbgsc we do have satellite valleys as you can see we do have satellite valleys okay along with the central valley we do have the satellite valleys let me demarcate these valleys with their names so there's more this is basically a satellite valley this is central valley this is again a trapping region trapping layer okay so as you can see so as you can see the electrons can easily make a transition from the minima of the conduction band to the maxima of the valence band without getting trapped into the trapping layer so electrons can directly make a transition from the conduction from the maximum minima of the conduction band to the maxima of the valence band let me write these points electrons electrons directly make transition from minima of conduction band to maxima of valence band without getting trapped in the trapping layer okay so radiation released radiation is released in form of light this property of uh, these type of semiconductors make them a perfect candidate to be used in the fabrication of optoelectric devices good candidates for fabrication of fabrication of optoelectric devices okay so this basically makes them a good candidate for the fabrication of uh, optoelectric devices since they are not changing their direction so the momentum momentum of electrons does not change it remains constant it remains constant but kinetic energy and potential energy do change okay so and because of direct transmission carrier lifetime is less okay now let's discuss further let, let's dive deep into the concepts uh, related to direct band gap semiconductors so we first start with the let's say we first start with gallium arsenide that's basically the semiconductor which is formed by a combination of gallium and arsenic okay so what is gallium arsenide let's discuss about that let's first discuss the drift velocity uh, with respect to the electric field intensity curve there is a very unique difference there is a very very distinctive difference between the plots of drift velocity with respect to electric field intensity between gallium arsenide and gall uh, or uh, silicon and gallium germanium okay so now let's have a look at the plot of this so let's uh, so this is basically the plot of drift velocity with respect to the electric field intensity let's mark this as 0 to a okay and this mark this as 0 to b so in gallium arsenide material electron transfer mechanism takes place because of which negative differential change in the diffraction velocity with respect to electric field intensity takes place okay so initially when the electric field is increased 
electron present in the central valley will get improvement in the drift velocity which is more compared to germanium and silver so this is basically showed in uh, demarcated in this region 0 to a okay so again when the electric field intensity is increased the drift velocity does increase and this is shown in uh, this plot and this uh, this uh, change is uh, much more prominent in gallium arsenide when compared to that in germanium and silicon okay so with the electric so uh, by the way i just want to bring to notice that gallium arsenide has two valid two valid structure two valid structure means it has one central valley and the other one is the satellite valley which i showed in the uh, which i showed a couple of minutes ago okay in the energy band diagram you can see this is basically the uh, the energy band diagram of gallium arsenide which has one central valley and one is uh, the uh, 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 satellite valley okay so so first uh, so uh, i think you must be clear uh, with the, this uh, behavior of the plot this behavior in the change in the velocity uh, with respect to electric field intensity in the region 0 to a okay now when the electric field is further increased then the electrons transfer takes place from the central valley to the satellite valley electrons jump from the satellite valley to the electrons jump from the satellite valley to the from the central valley to the satellite valley so for example this is basically the valence band this is basically the conduction band and this is basically the satellite valley okay so this is basically satellite valley this is satellite valley this is central valley central valley and this is central valley so when the electric field is uh, less than so when the electric field is less than 10 to the power 3 volts per centimeter electrons make a transition from the conduction band from the valence band to the conduction band okay and elect and when we increase the electric field intensity to 10 to the power 4 volts per centimeter or for the electric field greater than 10 to the power 3 volts per centimeter electrons make a transition from the conduction from the conduction from the central valley to the satellite valley so electrons make a transition from the from the uh, central valley to the satellite valley this leads to the increase in the potential energy of the electrons okay now this leads to the increase in the potential energy of the electrons this is for electric field greater than 10 to the power 3 volts per centimeter so when the electric field is further increased then the electrons transfer take place from the central valley to the satellite valley during this time the potential energy value increases and the kinetic energy decreases in expense of the kinetic energy because of which drift velocity decreases and this portion is showed in the region a b this is shown by the region a b okay because of the transmission of the uh, because of the transition of the electrons from the central valley to the sat uh, satellite valley there is a decrease uh, there is a decrease in the kinetic energy of the electrons which in turn means decrease in the drift velocity of the electrons and increase in the potential energy of the electrons and this portion is showed here is showed by is shown in the region a b so there is a decrease in the drift velocity of the electrons okay this is indicated in the graph a b here you can see so when the electrons enter into a satellite valley with the electric field again the drift velocity increases as shown in the graph from b onwards okay the same thing the same phenomena takes place as uh, uh, as took place in the region 0 to a drift velocity again increases so this is basically the plot of gallium arsenide which has a two valley structure okay so what happens when the when electric field intensity is greater than 3 volts per centimeter kinetic energy of electrons increases which implies drift velocity of electrons sorry this is decreases of the electrons decrease decreases and potential energy of electrons increases okay 
so this is the main important this is the important thing to note down and to remember okay basically this phenomena this phenomena of the movement of the charge carriers of the electrons from the central valley to the satellite valley is known as gun effect i will write that thing down so uh, let me explain one more term which pops up uh, along with which pops up uh, as a result of uh, the explanation of the graph the dwarf velocity with respect to electric field uh, intensity graph of uh, gallium arsenide so we that's basically known as gun effect gun effect so it is important to note down that uh, this type of uh, this type of uh, behavior uh, behavior in the curve is uh, basically observed in the tunnel diode but but gallium arsenide is showing this such type of uh, behavior in this drift velocity when we increase the electric field intensity which does not even have the pn junction that's why it is known as a gun diode gallium arsenide is known as a gun diode and the phenomena is known as gun effect okay so the negative negative region the negative region which is basically ab or you can say negative region behavior is observed in the case of tunnel diode but this is exhibited by the gallium arsenide without any pn junction so gallium arsenide is called as gun diode and the effect is is called as gun effect okay and electrons are moving inside the material without pn junction influence so these electrons will maintain high energies which you can write as hot carriers electrons are hot carriers in this case so gun diode is also called as hot diode okay okay now let's uh, discuss in brief about uh, uh, indium phosphide what's the difference between indium phosphide and gallium arsenide so for indium phosphide indium phosphide when we compare the drift velocity with respect to electric field intensity curves of gallium arsenide and indium phosphide let's say this is basically the uh the behavior of uh, the curve the curve of uh, corresponding to gallium arsenide and if we see for the indium phosphide it's a bit different it's a bit different it's like this so this is for in this is for indium phosphide and this is for gallium arsenide okay this is the variation so you can see that the variation in the in indium phosphide is more superior to that more superior to uh, gallium arsenide okay so but why is that indium phosphide has three valid structure three valid structure so if we just see the energy band diagram of indium phosphide this is valence band this is conduction band so this is a central valley this is middle valley 
this is upper value so it has basically three valley structure this is this is also known as satellite valley this is central valley this is middle valley and this is upper valley so when the electrons make a transition from the conduction band to the uh, uh, conduction band to uh, the conduction from the from the central valley to the middle valley so that sort of phenomena is known to us what happens is that the kinetic energy decreases and potential energy increases and when we further increase the electric field intensity what happens is that electrons will further make a transition from the middle valley to the upper valley which leads to the which leads to further increase a further increase in the potential energy and a great plunge in the kinetic energy of the electrons which is more superior to that in the case of gallium arsenide so electrons make a transition from from a uh, valence band to the central valley and then from the uh, from the uh, middle from the central valley to middle valley and from middle valley to upper valley so as it is moving far away from the from the valence band and more nearer to the nucleus of the other atom the potential energy of the electrons increases further and kinetic energy of the electrons decreases further so so uh, decreases decrease or dip in the kinetic energy kinetic energy of electrons in indium phosphide are is more superior than in the case of gallium ars gallium arsenide okay so that's why you see more decrease or more uh, a, a very distinguishable plunge in indium phosphide when compared with that in the case of gallium arsenide okay so there are two main basic differences between gallium arsenide and indium phosphide both of both of them are the examples of direct band gap semiconductor because the central valley the minimum minimum of the central valley just lie above the maxima of the conduction band so there are some more points which are need to be considered uh, considered for uh, uh, gallium arsenide is that uh, gallium arsenide is used in the fabrication of in the fabrication of leds lasers tunnel diode Vector diode, pin diode, impact diode, microwave, ICs, etc. Okay. Gallium arsenide can be converted into N type. and p type by adding amphoteric materials okay so for n type gallium arsenide material how can we convert gallium arsenide into an n type gallium arsenide the dopants are for that the dopants are germanium beryllium zinc cadmium so germanium beryllium zinc cadmium act as the donor dopants to gallium arsenide hence converting gallium arsenide into an n type gallium arsenide material okay and for p type gallium arsenide dopants used are silicon selenium tellurium so which basically act as uh, working as acceptors for gallium arsenide and replaces gallium and we can get p type gallium arsenide so these are the dopants for for converting gallium arsenide into p type gallium arsenide silicon selenium selenium and tellurium and for n type gallium arsenide dopants used are germanium beryllium zinc cadmium okay
okay so this basically ends the discussion and the uh, discussion on the difference between uh, indirect band gap semiconductors and direct band gap semiconductors following which we start with the diffusion and diffusion currents diffusion and diffusion currents so what is diffusion diffusion is a it's basically a natural phenomenon the it is basically the migration of the charge carriers from higher concentration to the lower concentration or from higher density to lower density which is in which uh, which is uh, called as diffusion so diffusion is nothing but nothing but movement movement of charge carriers from higher concentration to lower concentration okay and occurs due to concentration gradient which we represent mathematically as dn by dx this is electron concentration gradient in electrons per centimeter cube per centimeter or you can say dp by dx as holes hole concentration gradient in holes per centimeter cube per centimeter understood okay so concentration gradient can be negative or can be positive if the charge carriers are moving from higher concentration to lower concentration the concentration gradient will be negative or we can explicitly make the charge carriers move from lower concentration to higher concentration in that case the concentration gradient will be positive so dn by dx can be negative and uh, can be made positive but in general the concentration gradient is negative because that occurs on its own and by if by any, any other means we can make the concentration gradient to be positive when the when we can make the charge carriers move from lower concentration to higher concentration so dn by dx or dp by dx are negative and can be made positive okay so for example let's be explained diagrammatically this represents higher concentration this is lower concentration so this is p or n so the whole or electron dis diffuse from higher concentration to lower concentration this is basically the length l l is known as length of diffusion so l represents the length of diffusion length of diffusion l so we define l as square root of d into tau centimeter d is the diffusion constant and tau is the charge carrier lifetime i have already given the definitions of d and tau in the last couple of lectures you should be familiar with these terms which i am using here right now otherwise you won't be able to understand either of them so and we know this thing that d is basically mu vt okay so l can be written as square root of mu vt tau so this is the expression of diffusion length so from here we can see that l depends on on d and mobility of charge carriers which in turn means 
that L depends on on temperature as well. Okay. So, so electron diffusion constant is ln is equal to square root of dn tau 1 centimeter and whole diffusion constant is lp square root of dp tau p centimeter. Tau n is basically the uh, electron lifetime and tau p is the whole lifetime. Now, the diffusion gra the uh, the concentration gradient leads to results into diffusion currents as well. So, electron diffusion current density, which we represent as J n diffusion, and the mathematical equation of that is Q d n dn by dx. You don't require the proof of uh, this equation which basically is found using continuity equation. So, that's, uh, it's not required. Okay. So, you, you just need to remember this expression q dn dn by dx and whole diffusion current density is jp diffusion is minus q dp dp by dx amperes per centimeter square why we include why uh, so in this case you must be you uh, all must be wondering why have i incorporated negative sign in this expression of whole current density that's because Q is positive in case of uh, hole and Q is negative in case of electrons and dn by dx by default we consider it uh, to be negative. So in order to compensate the negative, va in the negative value of dp by dx in the whole diffusion current density expression, we incorporate negative sign because that's not uh, compensated by the, uh, by the value of q in case of your in case of hole that's why the just a notation okay so in a semiconductor the total diffusion current densities is equal to so in a semiconductor total diffusion current diffusion current density is J diffusion, J n diffusion plus J p diffusion, which is Q d n d n by d x minus Q d p d p by d x. Okay. This is the overall current density in a semiconductor. Hence, we can say that current, then diffusion current will be equal to J diffusion into area. I diffusion is J diffusion into area. By default, consider A as 1 centimeter square or 1 meter square. If nothing is mentioned in the question, about the area of the semiconductor and the current density and the current is asked and diffusion current is asked then take a as 1 centimeter square or 1 meter square okay so uh, total current density in a semiconductor total current density in a semiconductor this is a, in a semiconductor total current density in a semiconductor is jn plus jp electron current density and hole current density okay where electron current density is equal to jn drift plus jn diffusion so this is basically 
sigma into e plus q dn dn by dx or n q mu n e plus q dn dn by dx ampere per centimeter square similarly your j total similarly your jp is jp drift plus jp diffusion minus q dp sorry is p p q mu p e minus q dp dp by dx this is jp ampere per centimeter square so drift current depends on carrier concentration mobility and third is electric field intensity so but drift current mainly depends on electric field intensity if somebody asks you uh what on what drift current uh, so what different uh, what drift current uh, mainly depends on in a semiconductor so you must say that it depends on the electric is depends mainly on electric field intensity and diffusion current diffusion current mainly depends on on concentration gradient so it's already tacit from the name of the currents itself that drift current mainly depends on the electric field intensity because it includes drift in its terminology and diffusion current mainly depends on the concentration gradient because it includes the terminology diffusion now let's see some examples some numerical problems on this okay so calculate the intrinsic conductivity and resistivity of germanium at 300 kelvin assume ni is equal to 2.5 by 13 per centimeter cube mu n is 3800 and mu p is 1800 so sigma i we know is ni q mu n plus mu p okay 2.5 into 10 to the power 13 into 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 into mu n plus mu p If you sum these two, you get fifty-six hundred centimeter square per volt second. So this basically, if you solve, it comes out to be zero point zero two two four mo per centimeter. This is sigma i. Okay. Resistivity is one by sigma i. One upon zero point zero two two four is forty-four point six four ohm centimeter. So next question says a germanium has a leakage current of 5 microampere at 10 degree celsius find its value when temperature is 40 degree celsius so we know the concept for every 1 degree for every 10 degree rise in temperature the leakage current increases by two times or you can say the leakage current just doubles for every 10 degree rise in temperature so here you can see that the current is increasing by three times so so the current the current at 40 degree celsius will be equal to 5 microampere into 2 into 2 into 2 because from when the temperature increases from 10 to 20 it's 2 then with 20 to 30 it's 2 and then 30 to 40 it's 2 so the answer will be equal to 8 is answer will be equal to 40 microampere so current at 40 degree celsius is 40 microampere Okay. Look at the next question. A germanium has leakage current of five microampere at ten degrees Celsius. Find its value when the temperature is twenty-five degrees Celsius. So we know the equation. I naught T two is equal to I naught T one two to the power T two minus T one upon ten. So this will be equal to I naught twenty-five will be equal to 
5 into 10th power minus 6 to the power 25 minus 10 upon 10. This comes out to be 14.14 into 10 to the power minus 6 or 14.14 micro ampere. So this is basically I naught 25 degrees Celsius. So this is the answer. Okay, let's move on to the next question. A silicon wafer is 0.5 millimeter thick. A potential of 100 millivolt is applied across the thickness. What is the electron drift velocity if mu is equal to 0.2 centimeter square per volt second? So let's answer the first question. Electric field intensity that is flowing across the thickness of the semiconductor is volts upon distance. We are taking the magnitude. So voltage of 100 millivolt is applied. 100 into 10 to the power minus 3. And thickness is 0.5 into 10 to the power minus 3, which results into 200 volt per centimeter. So drift velocity is mu into E. Mu is 0 0.2 into 200 is equal to 40 meters per second. You have to take care of the units as well. Let's say if you are given... Uh, Electric, if you find the electric field intensity in volt per meter and mu is given in uh, centimeter uh, meter square per volts per second, if you directly multiply these two terms without considering the units properly, you might end up into a wrong result. You might end up with a wrong result. So that should not happen. You have to be extra careful in uh, writing, in dealing with the units. Okay. So drift velocity here is 40 meters per second. Now to answer the second question, asking for the time required. Velocity is distance upon time. We can say that time required will be distance upon speed. So distance is 0.5 millimeter upon 40 meters per second, 0 0.0125 <coughs> millisecond. Okay. So, small uh, next question. A small concentration of minority carriers are injected into a homogeneous semiconductor crystal at one point and having an, an E of 10 volts per centimeter, which is applied across the crystal, so that the minority carriers in the crystal will be moving a distance of 1 centimeter in 20 microseconds. Calculate mu in centimeter square per volt second. So, we are now required to find out the value of electric field intensity. So, here it is clear that the electrons are moving under the influence of electric field intensity. So we can consider the velocity to be a drift velocity. Okay, this is a semiconductor and they are injected. Electrons are moving a distance of, let's say in this case, 1 centimeter. If the electric field intensity of 10 volts per centimeter is applied in 20 microsecond. So we can find out the drift velocity, which is d by t distance traveled is 1 centimeter 20 into 10 to the power minus 6 is equal to 0 0.05 into 10 to the power 6 centimeter per second. So mu mobility is Vd by E which is 0 0.05 into 10 to the power 6 centimeters per second upon 10 volts per centimeter. This comes out to be 5000 centimeter square per volt second understood so the mobility of the electrons is 5000 centimeter square per volt second now let's have a look at the next question okay so a silicon sample with a unit cross section area given below under the thermal equilibrium so an external voltage of 1 volt is applied and nd the doping concentration of the semiconductor is 10 to the power 16 per centimeter cube. The length of the semiconductor slab is x, uh, is 1 micrometer. You are given these parameters. Okay, We need to find out the magnitude of the field at 0 0.5 micrometer. Since by default we consider the semiconductor to be uniform. So as I, al as I had already discussed in the, so as I already discussed in the past few lectures, that uh, a past one lecture that the electric field since uh, the semiconductor is uniform, so electric field intensity varies linearly with the distance. 
so electric field intensity at x is equal to 0.5 micrometer is also equal to find the electric field intensity at x is equal to 1 micrometer so mod v by x is 1 upon 1 into 10 to the power minus 6 which is 10 to the power 6 volt per centimeter so this is the electric field intensity now we need to find out the drift velocity the drift uh, sorry the, uh, the drift current jn drift drift current at x is equal to 0.5 micrometer is equal to sigma into e which is q n mu n into e <clears throat> okay so n here basically nearly equal to nd since because it's an n type semiconductor this is n type semiconductor so we can consider the n to be equal to nd okay so jn drift equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 into 10 to the power 16 plus into 1350 into 10 to the power 4 <coughs> is equal to 2.16 into 10 to the power 4 ampere per centimeter square so jn drift is equal to this you have to take an extra care while considering the units of the of each of these q n mu n in e they should be in the same unit so that you do not face any difficulty in solving the questions afterwards so take, uh, you need an, you need to give an extra care you need to give an extra care to the units mentioned okay you have to bring all of these terms into the same unit and then solve and then proceed to solve the problem okay folks i'm ending the lecture here please go through this lecture uh, very carefully because the topics that i have covered in this lecture are very important and very conceptual and you need to remember all these concepts you have to embed these things in your mind so that you won't forget these in the examination and these are very important for the as if we consider uh, for the, it is very important for the examinations okay for gate 2019 and for any other examination or any other psu examination these concepts are very important because they are basic and important so mark this whole lecture as important so i'm ending the lecture thank you very much